Good afternoon. Everyone told me it would be cool. I'd been hearing about it ever since I moved to Nebraska, but nothing could have prepared me for what it actually felt like to be there. On the day before Easter, my daughters and I arose way before sunrise at a hotel in Kearney. We packed up our stuff, ate a quick cinnamon roll in the lobby downstairs, hopped in the car, and made our way out east on I-80. When we pulled off the highway, our tires crunched down a long dirt road. We passed farmhouses and cornfields under a dark sky. And then we pulled into our destination. We had come to see the sandhill cranes for the first time. Every year, half a million sandhill cranes stop for a few weeks on the Platte River during their spring migration. On their way from the southwestern United States to places as far north as Canada and even Siberia, they come here because it's safe and near plenty of food supplies. That morning, we stepped into a viewing blind set out over the Platte River. It was just a simple wooden structure that disguised us and allowed us to watch the birds at close range. We shuffled into it in silence in our winter coats and took our places in front of open, cut-out windows. The air was cold and the sky a deep blue. The sun behind us was just beginning to hint at rising. And to my amazement, in front of us, we had a full view of the moon in a lunar eclipse. Through the binoculars, I could see thousands and thousands of cranes. They were everywhere, standing on the sandbars, hidden in the grasses, stretched back as far as my eye could see. They were squeaking and calling, poking each other, stretching their wings. They were waking up and getting ready for a new day. We waited and watched a long time. It felt almost holy. As the sun began to hit the river, the birds became more active. Some started dancing with each other, as they often do. Their calls became louder and more insistent. After a while, as I watched through the binoculars, I could see that off on the horizon, a swarm of cranes was lifting off into the sky. This was the moment we had been waiting for. We watched, transfixed, as before our eyes, thousands and thousands of cranes lifted off the river in a continuous wave and came toward us in a deafening roar. As a flock of them flew up over our humble little structure with their strange and haunting calls, so close I could almost touch them, tears just spilled out of my eyes. It was so real and so primal. It was so humbling to be right there with them. And it was so unabashedly good. I'm a minister who works with faith communities on the moral challenge of climate change. Because of the work I do, I tend to spend a lot of time thinking about the future. I read a lot of reports, and I think a lot about where we are headed, both ecologically and spiritually. Thinking about time is actually nothing new to religion. My tradition, the Christian tradition, has always included notions of time in its theology, ideas about how the world began and also about how it will end. The cranes that morning helped me think about time and hope. In my theological worldview, time is bound by love. My tradition teaches that the world was created out of love and that the ultimate goal of creation is to learn how to return that love. In this view of time, history is tending toward goodness. Better than goodness, really, it's tending toward perfection. To put it simply, I've been living in a worldview that says, ultimately, everything is going to be okay in the end. The problem, which is hard for a minister to admit, is that I'm just not so sure I can believe this anymore. Things are starting to go haywire on this blessed earth. 
You've heard, no doubt, about the severe drought that has gripped California for the fourth straight year and is leading 39 million people into completely uncharted territory. NASA scientists have said the state only has one year of water left. I called my friend Kristen, who lives near Berkeley, on her birthday in February. She normally has some kind of fun birthday plans involving balloons and an adventure. This year, she had a catch in her throat. San Francisco hadn't recorded a single drop of rain for the month of January. The first time in 165 years of records that's ever happened. She told me how living through day after day of 67 degree sunny weather through winter had turned into a twisted sign of something wrong. She couldn't sleep. She was raw with anxiety. She'd never been a climate activist, but this year, what she decided to do on her birthday was go to a climate march. On May 6, here in Lincoln, we were pummeled by a powerful, slow-moving thunderstorm. We received almost seven inches of rain in 24 hours. Salt Creek overran its banks in parts. My friend Melissa, who lives near it, had three feet of standing water in her basement. The whole thing's gonna have to be gutted to the studs. Thousands of people all over town had thousands of dollars worth of damage to their homes and businesses, including, I'm sure, many of you. I lost a whole finished basement's worth of carpet, including my younger daughter's bedroom. People say that was a 100-year flood event, but if you remember, it just happened six months ago. <laughs> we received almost six inches of rain one day in October. And this is exactly the kind of extreme weather event that climate scientists have said is going to happen with increasing frequency in our area. So as hard as that May 6 weather event was for so many of us, the truth is, it's going to happen again. When we are looking at a future in which homes are destroyed, species are died off, livelihoods are taken away, local governments are stressed beyond capacity, food supplies are threatened, and yes, thousands of lives are lost, we realize that we are facing down a fundamental shift in the relation of human beings to the natural world. And if our guideposts on our climate and our economy and geography and agriculture and ornithology and real estate and more are changing, then I have to wonder if our theological guideposts need to change too. Does it still make sense to believe in that notion of time tending toward perfection? Because it sure doesn't seem like it. I have found someone who's inspired me in my work recently. His name is Tim DeChristopher, and he spent two years in prison recently for his climate activism. He's now a leading voice for a spiritually centered, nonviolent climate movement. He says that if we want to provide real moral leadership to the climate movement, we need to do two things. We need to tell the truth, and we need to speak from hope. So I'm going to take Tim's call to heart and do what he suggests. The truth is that climate change is demanding that we do things differently. We cannot extract and burn any more fossil fuels. We're already looking at temperature increases of four to nine degrees by the end of this century. That's a mind-boggling figure on its own. But the fact is that the oil companies have enough fossil fuel reserves in the ground to exceed that limit 10 times over. And they're still looking for more. Ironically, the melting of ice in the Arctic due to global warming has actually opened up a whole new oil exploration boom there with trillions of dollars on the line. These companies cannot continue practices that endanger human life around the world. And women like us, we must not tolerate those who seek to profit from ruining the sacred gift of creation. Now the second thing that Tim to Christopher calls us to do is to speak from hope. This is the hard part. Every religious leader of every social movement through history has struggled to speak about hope, 
when at times it seemed ridiculous. There is a huge and messy gap between the world that God intended for us and the world that we have on our hands now. But our work is to close that gap. And there is hope. Last September, 400,000 of us turned out on the streets of New York City for the People's Climate March, the largest of its kind in history. Last year, CO2 emissions actually flatlined for the first time in history, even while the world economy grew. The consumption of gasoline in the United States actually dropped by 11% over the past decade, even while the population grew 8%. The cost of solar panels is at a historic low, creating a boom in that industry. Pope Francis will be issuing an official Catholic document this summer on the environment. He'll be talking about the moral call to action on climate change and the need for an integral ecology, a system where the natural world and the economy can exist in harmony with one another. His voice will be a beacon of hope for the world. Here in Nebraska, there's hope. Our public utility in Omaha last year decided to shut down one of the nation's dirtiest coal plants, thanks in large part to ordinary citizens like you who spoke up. Another big coal-fired power plant out in western Nebraska is going to be retooled so that its CO2 emissions are cut by 50%. And here in Lincoln, our utility made a fantastically bold decision last year to move to 48% renewable energy. That's one of the highest percentages in the country right now. I'm seeing faith communities all over the country face this challenge with joy and creativity. They are building momentum for a healthier world. I do the work I do because I believe that congregations have incredible resources to offer the climate crisis. And the future needs people who can roll up their sleeves, honor beauty, and practice hope. As for myself, I'm trying to find a new way to hope. My old way of believing that things would ultimately get better is crumbling. But I'm beginning to grasp a new and stronger kind of hope. Tim De Christopher says, that as much as we must fully recognize the harsh truth of the nature of the climate crisis, we must just as fully give thanks for the beauty and love that we appreciate in the world. Do you hear that? He's saying that the measure of our love for the beauty of the world needs to be equal to our honest engagement with climate change. When we can be faithful to this kind of love, a love that binds us together with each other and with creation, we find the basis for a new and more resilient kind of hope. It's entirely possible that the climate crisis is going to make us a better society. Perhaps it's time, after all, for an economy that has not respected the natural resources on which it depends to transform. Perhaps it's time for injustice and greed and the reign of shareholder return on investment to end. Perhaps it's time for us to reconnect with our bodies, our prairies, our watersheds, and each other. Now the Sandhill Cranes have been coming to Nebraska for nine million years. As they flew over my viewing blind in that ecstatic moment, time collapsed. I realized that I was living in their future. I was at the end of an epic time span for them. The world had changed dramatically around them, but they had survived. And that gave me hope. So my hope for you, for all of us, is that we may face this momentous challenge of our time and that it may make us passionate for the goodness and beauty that we love in the world. Whether we are soaring our way to a blessed future or bumbling our way to extinction is actually all up to us. 
I hope that our love will let us fly on ancient wings like the sandhill cranes with calls that may at times be haunting and insistent, bound with love for the world and for each other toward a hopeful future. Thank you.